There's a place I have found in the shade on the ground, far from a worry central. Hello and welcome to episode four of the Vine Permaculture Podcast. This week we have myself, Cormac. Hello, Clancy's could all join us. And uh, we also have Mike here as well. Um so today's lunchtime learning was about seeds and starting seeds, the different methods of seeds, and then taking care of seedlings. And so now's a, a good time of the year to get a jump start on the growing season. So we discussed today, we discussed um seed different ways of growing. So that's just growing them in tubs and sprinkling them. That's just try to remember them all. Uh seeds in a ziplock bag. Um direct sowing. Uh just the traditional standard trays. And I'm missing two as well. <laughs> you know, it's in the lunchtime there and the links in the description below. If you want to go and watch that first and then we just talk about this after. So if you have you any preferred way of starting seeds, Mike, or any we do the, we do the soil block method, um, which takes a little time to get because uh, you need that perfect consistency of the soil so that it remains a block when you take. So there's a metal. We have a metal thing it makes a couple of boxes. You know, yeah, we, we, we covered we covered that in today's episode. I I, I do the same. Okay, um, so something different than that. No, I was just saying, what do you prefer? I I we we demonstrated uh, the soil block. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I saw. I did. I saw. I saw your your bit the bit on the lunchtime learning, yeah. um, and uh, yeah. So you soil block is a matter of consistency. It's like a little bit of moist. It's almost like cake, you know, like a cake consistency. Um, that's like probably the least expensive because you don't need materials. Although you know, I've also saved up toilet rolls and you know have them and tried that method one time. But then you know you need a good toilet roll saving system all year. So <laughs> until, you know, until you have that. So it just seems or, like the soil or, block. or three kids. <laughs> right. Yeah. We have no labor except ourselves. So, uh, um, uh, so yes, yeah, so soil block. And then we've done, of course, the, um, the plastic trays with, you know, the seedling where the, the roots will hold the soil together if it's small enough. And then you can just, that's, that works out pretty well too. tend to, to head toward the more low tech, um, less material needing, methods in general just like you were doing in the in the uh in the video earlier yeah i like the soil blocks now because it's as you say you have to the the mix i had today was probably a bit too wet you seen it dripping out if you noticed that yeah a little but I, I just had to get on with it but it, it held together the blocks that's the main thing that mix was okay for the bigger blocks but for the smaller blocks it wasn't so i had a, a bit of trial and error there so what you didn't see in the video was that you can have the wee smaller blocks and then they fit into the big blocks, which is really handy when you're, so if you plant like a lettuce in there, it air prunes and then you take your smaller blocks, put it into your bigger block and then that allows the root to go out. And then... Okay, that's nice. Yeah, I just have, I've lost my wee implements because in that block thing, there's like three, for want of a better word, like nipples that make the indent. Yeah, sure. <laughs> So you can take take the plastic ones out for the seed and as actually put in one the size of the block. So in the mess that my garage is, it's they've all disappeared. So I'm sure <laughs> I'll, f I'll find them in a, at the bottom of a bag somewhere. So that's really handy. Yeah, we. I think you have the same the same brand thing that we have because yeah, you lose a little plastic nipples. I don't know why they don't just make them metal. I'm sure they saved a penny, but they seem to fall off and fall out of the thing and. God forbid, then you have to like use your pinky to make it the indent. <laughs> Get your hands dirty. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the, the toilet roll ones are good. The only thing you have to watch for that is they fall apart if you have them too long. Um, So they are they are good. I've used them before, but then they just, if they get, uh, you just have to be careful because they don't last that long. They might last a week or two, but to get too wet, they fall apart. Yeah, and you're usually a seedling is germinating longer than two weeks so yeah it's probably the glue it's like a spiral cardboard thing and it's probably the glue comes apart because of the moisture in the soil right again you uh, you have to be i'm not at that level of toilet roll organization yet <laughs> <laughs> so that's why i'd rather just like learn the soil black thing 
Also, um, then there's a uh, what else have we done? Um, that that is a really good way to get rid of egg cartons. You could probably use an egg carton, a toilet paper roll. These things. We have a wood stove, so we have an easier solution for that. And we do actually save the toilet rolls for that paper towel rolls. If you want to talk about resilience and stacking functions, if you have a puppy, take a paper towel roll, throw it on the floor. Magic. Magic happens. <laughs> so we, we let her play with that as a toy first, and then it goes into the, the fire starting box. So it has an extra function slip in there. <laughs> oh, very good. Uh, well, my dog would just eat it. <laughs> well, that if, if yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, so there would be, there would be nothing left it, just be torn up, and I'd end up having to clean it. Um, yeah, I've used the egg curtains before as well. That's handy. Again, it's the mm -hmm. same thing. It, it breaks apart. But uh, if you get the wee, uh, sort of like break off the wee section, you can just throw it in as well and plant. But I've, I think I mentioned the video there. Uh, so for Steelands, you, you sort of start for just to get a run on, on run on the season. Uh, as well, we the likes of sunflowers. Like if I plant sunflowers direct in the ground, they get eaten. If I plant them yeah. and they're two or three inches, they get eaten. <laughs> so I almost sure. have to wait till the sunflowers like bursting out of the uh bursting out of the thing and nearly root bound before I can put it in the ground because they just get eaten. I don't know whether it's birds or it's bugs or slugs or what. But once it gets past a certain stage, then it, it's they grow. Uh because I mean yeah, like, it's and grass too. Like we we had planted in planted them on um our septic mound maybe three years ago and ended up doing like a lot of work to cut through the grass and you know dig the hole down because we were planting probably six to one foot seedlings you know that we were and they they made it through the grass but then i had to mow the grass in between them and they ultimately they they grew and we had like a hundred sunflowers on the the mound but because it was zone three or four, it was really far all the way down the hill from the house. It, you know, it, it ended up, we, the birds got it way before we even thought about it. So they got the seed experiment. The, the seed, yeah, they just, yeah, they ate the seeds. And then the ones that we could save, we hung up in our greenhouse. And then the vole or mouse or something got up, climbed up the side and came down the string. I was hanging it up too, and it ate all of them. So discouraged with the sunflowers. Got to wait another year. Yeah, no, I wasn't too bad. I, I, I get them every. We don't have any problem with pests. That like I, I was able to keep the sunflowers until they all went to seed. I got the, all the seed and then the seed heads, hung That's them in right. the garage, and then that was me. Then it, I, I'm still picking up tubs with seeds in it. <laughs> it's like, what are they? What year were they from? Um, that sounds good problem to have. And uh, what I like is it's sunflowers. It's like thousands of seeds. They, they're just they're, they're crazy. <laughs> the, the big Russian sunflower, the um, the giant. No, I, 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 I don't. I, I, I don't know why. I had, uh, it was a mixed packet I got from Irish Seed Savers. It's just like I think it was like mixed varieties. But okay. I, I, it's great to throw them in the chickens, and it keeps the chickens amused and entertained. So, that's that was a so the the meat is great. So you can actually you can extract the oil from them. I think. You can uh, roast them and eat them. You can feed them to your chickens. Like there's loads of uses for them. Yeah, it's one of the yeah, big, big oil seed crops, you know. Um, but there, I think the practicality of that on a homestead level um, kind of have to be all in. That's kind of a big system because you would need a press, you know, the proper press for. So I don't know how much you could actually produce. I actually haven't looked into it, but. No, neither have um, I. It's just kind of more much. on the survival level, yeah. I believe. Um, uh, but if you had sunflower seeds for snacks um, or chickens, obviously chickens, it's great to have chickens because you can dispose of what you don't give the dogs, you can give the chickens, you know. So. <laughs> uh, and then do you ever use, uh, I started doing it a few years ago was, it's like uh, we get Chinese food in here and they come in a plastic tub. So it's like basically six inches by three inches. With a uh, takeaway, is that yeah, what you like call it? yeah, takeaway, takeout, whatever. And uh, take out here in the in the state. Uh, so you get a takeaway box and basically put a an inch of soil on it, and then just sprinkle as many seeds as you want. And then as, as the seedlings germinate, then you can pick them out, 
Uh, it, it, it's it's good if you want high germination. So what you can do is actually close the lid on the box, keeps the moisture in, and then once they start germinating, mm-hmm. you can take the lid off. And it's good because you get plenty of germination and improves your germination rates. But then the hard work comes in when you have like a hundred salad seeds are looking at you. <laughs> so then you have to pick each one out and put it in a pot. Pick it, and it's torture. So if you imagine if you've done half a dozen tubs, 40 seeds in each tub, that's 200 and what is it? 40 motions. You have to pick out a seedling 240 times and put it in, in a tub. So there's, there's ups and downs to these things. Yeah. And there's, you know, the thought there, uh, cause we, we have a greenhouse. Um, which is still in kind of construction mode. So it's not in full. We've used it in the Springs to put seeds out and we've had a thousand seedlings in there at one point in our, in our best season so far, but because we're still under construction right now, the, the greenhouse is just not going to be, we we have to go to California. Our daughter is, um, is graduating as a vet in May. So we're flying out to California right in the middle. It's the second year that we've done that right in the middle of the growing season. So we've kind of like, you know, had to, uh, just pick our battles this year um but anyway back so the greenhouse it keeps it it's around zone eight i've been measuring the temperature for two years so it's it got down to 17 fahrenheit which is zone eight so um we um we are going to try to you know keep all our seeds in there but what you were saying about the you know all the salad picking out all the individual salad stuff i like the idea of broadcasting and like letting the seeds kind of battle it out i probably just picked and just call that a salad mix and then just let it grow right in the thing there and then just pick from it. That's, that's our plans to keep greens all year long in the greenhouse. Plus some other things. We got an avocado tree for Christmas. We'll see if that'll grow here in Northern Vermont, but uh, maybe it will in our greenhouse. Um, Very good. But yeah, like also there's as for a, a small farmer homestead in that, there's the microgreen. Um, a lot of restaurants will buy microgreens from you. And that's very similar, I believe, in just being on a tray. And although that's a higher standard if you're going to be selling them, but it, you know, just for the homestead, you could probably just harvest right out of that thing, just let the lettuce grow there. May the best leaf win, you know. Yeah, I think that's they're they're packed very tight though, weren't they? They're yeah, those microgreens. I've never, I've never actually done microgreens. I've, I've been meaning to do it. I brought microgreen seeds. <laughs> so it's wow, just, what, what kind? I have uh peas there. Um, uh, I think it's radish. Um, okay. just the normal standard ones. I think it's not. And uh, what I have done now, I was the, I was at the, I don't know what you call it, the garden center the other day, and I bought a packet of sunflowers. So it's just going to see. And it, this was like bird feed, sunflowers, sunflower seeds oh. for birds. And I was just like, yeah. I, I could, and it was like two pound. And I thought, well, if I was to buy them as microgreen seeds, how much would they cost me? <laughs> but instead, I have a big, big box of bird seed. And I was going to give that a go to see how many, uh, see if I could get any sunflowers germinating from that and try to grow them as a microgreen. So, um, so how fast growing are sunflowers? I, like radish and pea are pretty fast growing, so they're going to be micro quicker. You yeah. Know? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm just curious. Think... Sunflower is, is what? Is that a hundred days? Or no, uh, ten to fourteen days, I think. I'm not sure. No, oh, yeah. not to germinate. I meant to. Uh, oh, they harvest. To, yeah, to harvest. Like yeah, radishes, it... you harvest in you know like a two month and a half. Uh, but if you're growing them as microgreens, you, you do not harvest them as shoots. So they're only like an inch high, two inches. You, you harvest them after two weeks, do you not? Okay. Just wonder how tender they are. Don't know. We're going to find out. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, that's how you do it. I'm like, I'm ruining your experiment because I'm like already looking ahead and saying, no, it's not going to, it's going to be too rough. But that's what, it's, that's what it's about. You just try these things and that's how we learn. And uh, I like that's... the video. There's a video on. Uh, I think it's Paul Goichi says, no, like, the Teddy you can, can't do this stuff, but look, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's like, because you, you have to just do it, do the things. Like, I grow potatoes in the same pl- place every year, and people tell me I can't do it. We have but a, uh, we have a similar it. saying on the farm um, from my, uh, my sister-in-law's at horticulture. She works in a big 
uh, you know, ornamental uh, landscaping place in uh, down in in, Penn, in Delaware. And she says, <laughs> which we always, uh, you know, repeat, the plant didn't read the book. <laughs> so, exactly. you know, stick it in the ground and <laughs> see what happens, you know, like. <laughs> uh, and you don't know if you have a microclimate. No, you could just have a nice wee warm spot that's a zone higher than everywhere else around you. You just don't know. But at the same time, too, you could be a zone lower than everybody else. It could be a really cold spot. <laughs> if you're on a, it, it always, a, it always active. reminds me. And it's, I keep draining my thoughts. Drain to this, to this point, and it's always. <clears throat> whenever there's like you're having these conversations about permaculture with people, and then there's like some kind of like wise conclusion we come to, it's usually involving permaculture principle number one: observe and interact, because. Before there was the internet and databases and, and plant books and all that, there was just observation. That's like what our ancestors did. They just like, they had nothing else to do. So they just like watched bees and plants and what happened with that. And they, you know, remembered it and recorded it. And that wisdom is like encoded into what we have today and all these seed hybrids, which all have a history, you know? Um, so I don't know. I just find it fascinating. Yeah, I like that one. The the plant didn't read the manual. <laughs> <That was it. laughs> doesn't it doesn't care. It just it's either going to die or it's going to live and pass on its seed, and that's it. Yeah, and I think the end of the day, Killing talked about seedling care. Uh, like I I depends on the year and how busy I am, how much of this I do. I mind doing it one year. I'm just getting overwhelmed at a greenhouse full of. Just seedling starts and then you end up missing half of them. Um, so I, I like the lazy direct sow as much as I can stuff. I do do the odd thing that extends your season, but just plant things when they're supposed to be planted. And a, a wee sort of to my circumstances, basically, my so I don't get any sun in my back raised beds until like St. Patrick's Day. It's just with the uh -huh. sun climbing, then it reaches a certain point over the house where I get sun. And that's the sort of right, that's the start. So I can, I can put a cloche out there or a cover and get the soil heated up. So that's like, that's the sign for me that that's the start of the growing season. Mm -hmm. So I, I could really sort of start the stuff earlier and get it in by March, but that's sort of when I tend to start. It's like, I don't go too early because we're still like, we're, we're, fr we're frozen again here. And it's mm -hmm. the ninth of March, so I've had it right up. If it's snow, right up to the end of March at times. Other times, it's been warmer. So just so you're, what what UK zone are you? I I think it goes from well one to ten. I I know across the whole island, I think it ranges from USDA six to nine. I think all of those ten zones fit in the six to nine area. Do you know what? Yeah, what we're nine. I, I'm nine here. Nine USDA or, or England or um nine USDA equivalent. No, it's oh, like, as nine. I say to people, it's not a Florida nine. <laughs> no, it's not. It's it's a nine. <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a nine and like I'm at fifty five degrees north in latitude. Yeah. So light is a problem. And then the heat. Yeah. So once the light and the heat goes in the summer, like you're looking at some uh, between seven and eight or like the days just. So it's like it's still dark at half eight, maybe, and then it's getting dark to half four. So that's sometimes earlier if it's cloudy. So like you, you lose the light and you lose the heat. And then in the summer, it doesn't get that hot that you get your heat hours for your like your tomatoes and your peppers. So they, they basically need to be indoors or just a microclimate where you could grow yeah. against maybe a south facing wall. Mm -hmm. So Although it's a zone nine, it's not a Florida nine. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so interesting. And that's, uh, you know, like minimally as a, a plant landscaping designer, we have to, um, you know, at least get the hardiness zone. You can't plant, you know, mangoes in Vermont. Um, but when you get into that, there's other nuances. The plant zones are, are really just a sketch. And what's really matters is the eco eco zones. Um you know, these eco regions and that all that fleshes out that difference, that that cold zone nine or not cold, cold. It, the thing is, is you're, you're artificially heated where you are on yeah. the island. Uh, and the, so it's it's the, the Gulf Stream pulling up southern heat that you shouldn't have. 
because your sun hours and your plants, you know what I mean? They're, yeah. they're, they're getting the right sun for where they're at, but you're getting this like sort of artificial heat, I guess. I mean, it's good, good for England, you know, um, but it's weird. Yeah. That, that really illustrates that the zone system, just the temperature is not enough really to, you know, and, and especially in any kind of nuanced situation um, you need, you need those other layers of information the climate the climate information basically yeah two plus where we're are we're, we're uh ireland used to be a temperate rainforest years ago so that's 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 what we should be before mm-hmm. they chopped all the trees down so it's a very moist climate it's very humid so you can't when you're we're talking about things like food storage you can't really it's very difficult to store because it's so moist and damp that everything everything rots so it's very difficult everything has to make sure you have the right airflow if you've no airflow that you get mold straight away. Yeah, yeah, sure. Whereas you wouldn't get that in another zone nine where it's drier. So that's I suppose where the design comes in that you have to just sort of think about all these things and every everywhere is different, every circumstance is different. So as a beginner gardener, when you're considering these when I when you say I just like I'll have to be very careful now the seedlings I just done that they don't get moldy. So I'll have to make sure that there's plenty of airflow. I'll have to go out and off that tub and make sure that it's aired and make sure that uh so when it's warm during the day, going out lifting off that thing, making sure there's a fan to, to, to allow that circulation. So it's like you're basically evaporating off the old water until the new water comes and settles on it. Um so uh, these things are all you have to consider with seedlings as well as your your moisture climate your your, your zone and where you're doing it. I do it in the garage. It's probably not the best thing place to do it, but it's what yeah, I was going to ask you earlier. Um, yeah, where where is it that you put? I saw the video, but I couldn't quite tell. So you're doing that. That was in your garage. Yeah, and that'll uh, give you an extra five degrees, maybe from the wind or. Well, there's a heat mat. I have a heat mat turned on there. Oh. Okay. So they're, they're actually all sitting on a heat mat. I had a bit of polished iron on for the soil box, but I removed that because the polished iron was doing such a good job that the ceilings weren't getting any heat. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I removed that top. But So I'll do a follow-up, but even now of just where the ceilings are at now, and if they're any starting to germinate. I should get, I put ones in the hot press. What I don't know what you call a hot press. It's like where we store our towels. So there's a, it's where my gas burner is, or or your press? we call it a hot press. So it's like where your hot water stored. Oh, a utility room. Yeah, basement. So, basement. So normally, if you have oil, you'll have a water tank full of water in there, and then you'll have your towel rack. So I just mm-hmm. put it in the towel rack in there, and That's uh good. normally it takes two or three days. But then again, it's. The I use that was for the Ziploc bag method. So it's the Ziploc bag method is good as well, but you have to be careful of mold too. And it's okay for things like cucumbers where you've only got 10, like 10 seeds. So you only have to really transplant 10 sort of germinated seeds. But if you do it for like for salad and you have 50, 60 seeds in there, it's like that's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. I'm not really familiar with the uh, Ziploc bag method. Could you explain that? Yeah. So basically what you do is you get a, a uh, paper towel, you damp it. Uh, you can put like it's water, but you can put hydrogen. We drop up hydrogen peroxide on there too to sort of clean the water. Okay. And then that sort of sterilizes the water. Um, nice. So you you spray this paper towel and you put the seeds. Just set the seeds spaced out on the paper towel. You put another paper towel on top and you dampen that and you just slide it on this lip lock zip lock bag. Seal that off, and then you put it somewhere warm. So it likes a cucumbers, which need like a steady 20 odd degrees, is it? Then you ensure that that is 20 degrees for like two days, and then that should germinate easier. So if you put it in a controlled room, it's not, the temperature's not going up and down, and you just, it gets you better germination rates. Okay. It's accelerating your germination because you get, you're creating a consistent microclimate. Yeah, and as well, like I have them seeds for several years. So I would say that the the germination rate on them, I suppose we better explain that. So every year your seeds lose a few percent of germination rate. So yeah, so I was just wanting to ensure that I get the most 
germination rate out of the 10 seeds of cucumber seeds are planted? Every year, your stored seeds in packages. Yes. Yeah. yeah, because of probably neutrinos coming from the sun. Um, okay, interesting. So, yeah, and I, again, it reminds me of land racing, which I know this isn't the topic of this uh, discussion, but it makes you think about it. Um, have you ever uh, grown potatoes or garlic from seed? No. Uh, Neither have I. I know it'd be interesting to try. Do you want to tell us how you do that or what what, what land racing is? Sure, yeah. I mean, we're talking about seeds, so I mean that's that is the topic. Um, so land racing is that I'm not an expert, but I'm learning as much as I can, and this is what we're gonna adopt as our standard for the farm. We're not gonna be able to do everything all at once, but capture a species at a time. So, you know, we buy seeds, we have all these wonderfully hybridized seeds you know, a history of people making selections and picking seeds. And uh, so today we have this amazing variety we can get on the internet, et cetera. But, you know, you're always trading some kind of convenience for power. That convenience of the you know, hybridizing and having those seeds doing just the things that we want them to do. There's a trade-off in the sense that the, the, the genetics start being, you know, altered and ticked down in, in certain ways. And they start because... So there's a concept of of NPK, of giving plants what they need, giving it to them, as opposed to them earning it and, and sucking it out of the ground like like their daddy did, you know? So plants, you know, when you give plants NPK and you give them fertilizer, suddenly they don't have to, you know, work as hard. They don't have to feed the bacteria with the, the exudates and that whole system of the arthropods and everything. So it's like, it's like doing your kids homework for them. Okay. Maybe they'll get a B or an A hopefully, but you're hurting your kid. Like it's terrible for your kids. So, so in that sense, it's terrible for your plants in a way. Although if you're just looking for a yield and you're, you know, which usually people are, then it's fine because you don't care. But if you're doing this every year as a, something that's important, and especially if you live in a microclimate or maybe you live on a planet, <laughs> that's going through going through climate change and therefore the yeah. zone that you're in now it could very well change it could go probably up you know in in our lifetime like in this period of planting that we're doing so when you're land racing you're doing what our ancestors did to get to those hybridized things but so to make a long story short what you want to do is you want to go back in history as far as you can in that hybridization thing because every every convenience added is some lost power nutrients um resilience uh you know etc when you do the plants homework for them they, it makes them a less healthy plant so you go back as far as you can in your genetics to find hybrid seeds or not um hybrid um what do you, um what's the term for it it's, heirloom uh, heirloom seeds thank you heirloom seeds thank you try to find heirloom seeds because you're going back further into those genetics. So you're, you're getting a healthier seed back then. So that's where you start. You pull that out of the history, you bring it, you pop it in your land. And but what I understand is it's a three-year process in general for land racing seeds. First year is, is fun. You just, you throw them in there and you see who survives. You take risks, you do what Cormac was doing. You know, you plant, you up zone, you know, Take some risks. Uh, you don't do this with your expensive fruit trees. You do this with your herbs, et cetera, you know. So let them fight it out. So the first year, you'll see who grows. Then the second year is you, now you're starting to see, you don't select the first year. I mean, you, you are selecting the survivor's win. Second year, um, you're developing it a little further. Um, you're not really selecting a little bit you are. And then by the third year, they should be, flowering they should be producing getting back those old genetics <laughs> excuse me customized for your land um and that way your your own personal seeds you can buy them from anywhere and start anywhere on the planet and start and then bring them here if they don't grow at all then you've gone too far but if they do grow that's the seed you want so land racing is just basically picking the best seeds out of it keeping a record of what you have um, there's also a sort of, there's a, a sort of attitude of, um, not needing to 
you know, worry about cross pollination. Let them cross pollinate, you know, with squash and the pepo, the, you know, cucurbit of pepo and um, the other kinds they have to look out for. So there's more and more, there's, there's land racing is, is handing over a lot more responsibility to the seed um, and less imposing what you want out of um, near your garden. We could do both, you know, you can, so to get back to garlic and potatoes, interestingly, like, I didn't even realize it. I mean, I guess I kind of knew it, but I never really thought of it in words. We're cloning them. It's just clones. It's just clones. When you take a potato and cut it up and split the things, it's a clone. When you take a garlic clove, split up the cloves, plant each clove, you're just cloning it. The genetics have gotten no better. They may have actually probably gotten worse because it's a clone. So each time you clone, it's like a Xerox copy. If you remember the old Xerox machines, each copy gets worse. You know, it's the same with our own genetics and our mitochondria and all that and how we age. It's copies, each copy, you know, over, over time. So, um, you know, by by land racing, you're, you're, you're taking that over and you're giving yourself custom seeds. Um, it's extra work. But, you know, this is kind of the top shelf thing. This is what our ancestors did because they didn't have any other choice. I mean, they they had to. Um, and so today we, we have that choice. We can um, do that. The problem is with garlic and potatoes are because they're so hybridized, not a lot of them seed. That's why you need to go back into the heirloom, like, well, get the ones that actually remember how to seed still. So when you do that, the first year you, you plant. And then you look, you look for which ones. Some of them will produce seeds, and they're these little pods. Um, yeah, this is a discussion for another, maybe the whole topic, because, but um, you know, these little pods. So you take the seeds from those, those few that grew, and then you plant again, and then the next year's more of them should flower. And then by the third or fourth year, I believe, you now have flowering garlic and flowering potatoes. So if you go a couple years. Um, doing this, which is harder than just cloning, you now you've recaptured those genetics and you've customized it for your own land. And now you could do both, which is what we plan to do is to, yes, try to find those seeds, but also we want to grow potatoes in the meantime. So we're going to clone some, work on our land raised seeds, and then go back and, you know, then we have the stronger genetics. And now if we wanted to clone one year, we could. Or we and continue to land race. So it's you're basically splitting into the two different gardens. One's like repairing all that land racing stuff, and the other one is just I, I need potatoes each year. So I'm going to grow them the old fashioned way anyway. But you know, and then the same with garlic. Garlic it very in a very similar way also produces this pod of flour, which is at the actual seeds. So when you do that, you're letting the genetics take back over. They're gonna that you know farming is about bringing in billions of farmers really it's about chickens or farmers they're going to do work for you um you know you're the farmer you could have a partner another human or whatever but honestly when you start bringing in animals they do a lot of work and the same thing goes for you know bacteria etc you know when you bring in compost you're basically bringing in a whole bunch of bacterial farmers and they're doing work for you because to do all these things in a quality way you need not just work from the scale of the human you need work all the way down to the soil level and the biology in there so in the same sense seeds their actual genetic and how genetics works and how certain things make it and certain things fail that's also a worker in a way that's it's doing designing for you it's doing work for you in improving itself there's no way that you could make that seed get better each year on your land you have to let it do the work and, you know, and let things fail, let things, things, you got to accept failure and, you know, to, to get a success. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of think of it on that level. Like it's, you know, with, with seeds are really the most powerful thing in the world in a way. Um, plants are the only, the only creature that makes its own food with the help of the sun, you know. Um, and, but then after that, you know, we to capture plants historically is we learned how to capture the seed and how to use it. And we can use it and abuse it. We can, you know, for we've used it for a lot of good things, hybridization. But at the same time, if you care about nutrition, if that's the most important thing to you, then you really need to start going back and hybridizing to get this deeper nutrition. Um, one last point. 
and I can uh, put the uh, I can find a link for this and, and add it to the end of this uh, podcast. But uh, they did some sort of some experiments done recently. And uh, the, the gist of it, and this is just this is, you know, just a, my memory of it, <laughs> watching a video, maybe, you know, probably about three weeks ago. But basically, they did an experiment to suss out whether these these the genetics of the seeds. Um, I'm sorry to suss out whether all these plant methods, all these different things you can do to the plant, you know, to produce, to, to create a bigger yield. What matters more, those efforts and all those, you know, different tricks and techniques versus just the genetics of the seed. And they found that it was like by far in, in the experiment, that was actually the genetics of the seed that that yielded the most nutrition. And it was consistently those that went back in time like hybrid wise uh, or um, heirloom wise i'm sorry um so that's really interesting right it's 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 the the genetics it's still the seed like that really kind of determines the the quality of of the seed it might not maybe you care about yield so you need a hybrid and that's what you care about and that's so that's what you're you're going to get um or maybe you care about nutrition on the other end so basically the, the conclusion was is bigger it is the less nutrition it has in it and it sort of makes sense if you just think of the concept of density usually the best strawberries are the small ones the little red the right bright red super tasty yeah you don't get as much but you get you get quality versus a gigantic strawberry that's pink maybe a little white that you find in the supermarket you know yeah you get a whole bunch of a whole bunch of flavorless strawberry there you know that's one of them uh the Japanese they make these expensive big strawberries, don't they? Like a thousand dollar strawberry. Oh yeah, well, oh, I think it's like crazy. Um, you don't right, care so about we'll... flavor if you're spending a thousand bucks on a strawberry. <laughs> well, it's something well, else that you care. You're about. walking around yeah. right that strawberry and saying, "Look at that!" All right, so that yeah. that touches. We talked to previous weeks, uh, a few weeks ago about seeds, and we're talking about uh, GMO seeds and why not to use them. So right. I think what, what you have talked about there is sort of. Is another reason why you don't use GMO seeds because they rely on external outputs and they they, they they work. So if you get a GMO seed, it's not it's not survey, it's not um uh, it hasn't adapted to your area, to your microclimate. It needs then the way they they basically so that seed then uh, needs to be fed the NPK, which is the fertilizer. And if it doesn't get the fertilizer, it doesn't grow. So as well as getting sold a GMO seed, you have to go and buy the, the correct fertilizer for that seed. Yep. Uh, and then you end up with a weak plant because it's just been given the stuff. And then yep. you can't actually uh, take the seeds off that because you're not allowed, it's illegal. And then you have to go back to the guy that sold you the seeds to get more seeds to grow the next year. So you, then you become chained to that supplier. And uh, we were, we're talking to a lady from Pakistan before and she was saying that the they're actually these big companies are out there pushing this on the farmers and it's 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 basically so they if you're say if you lived halfway up a hill and for thousands of years your ancestors and ancestors before you have been growing this wheat and you get a a decent crop of wheat and then all of a sudden this GMO seed comes with this fertilizer and you double your wheat crop and then the next year first year the fertilizer is free second year is free third year it's free and then all of a sudden they charge you for it then they're charging for the seed and then they've left it long enough that you don't have any original seed to go back to and this is how they that's sort of the, the ugly side of capitalism when it comes to seeds so people need to be wary of the GMO seed that yes yes it sounds great and it's fantastic and oh this is this is just great that this seed's invented but there is a darker side to it as well. And it comes back to my, my. this is like one of my favorite general principles. I love throwing out there. I've already said it once. I'm going to say it again. You trade power for convenience. Yeah. It's very convenient to get those big yields. And, oh, it's convenient to get that stuff for free. Nothing in life is free, of course. Never take candy from strangers. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you, you trade power for convenience. So you end up thinking, oh, this is great. And. And then you're stuck because it's not really genetics anymore. It's not really plants. It's a corporate business model. And in that agricultural model, I don't 
see that as the same thing that we're doing. They're they're growing money versus yeah. growing food. It's, I, it's a big difference when you eat at a restaurant and it's tasty and you have good memories and you know. But the, the food they're using seed oils over and over. You just unless it's a super duper expensive restaurant, they they it's a business, so they have to. It's a business, and that's a great thing. But there's there's a difference. Or even when you go to the supermarket and there's this package, this factory made this food for you um but they didn't they made a product that they need to eat corporations eat profits people eat food so when you cook for yourself you're 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 cooking for health you know flavor and health but when a machine is cooking for you which corporation is a machine it's a, it's a structure you know um it, it's cooking for profit so that that fundamental that's such a huge difference, such a huge difference, whether, you know, what, what is your intention in growing plants or, or growing, you know, for food? If, if it's a profit model, that's one thing, that's fine. But, you know, it has its hazards, but it's really different than growing, I think, growing plants for the sake of food and nutrition, because you're growing for human health um, directly, not you know, you're doing it probably indirectly with the money. Oh, I'll get, I'll buy medical insurance because I'm unhealthy. I'll fix it that way, you know, so. <laughs> All right, so if you're growing in your own garden, it's, uh, like, I, I, what I would say, I I could never believe the first time I ate salad that I grew myself, like a lettuce leaf. And I'd say his texture and I'd say his taste. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what the, uh, I can't eat store bought lettuce anymore because it's just disgusting, and so that even and anybody should be able to grow lettuce in your windowsill, especially yeah. like what I done. And I have a uh, one bed I just use. It's like two foot deep by nine foot, eighteen square foot, and that keeps me in salads for the summer. But I just use the cut oh, and come again. So you just you harvest the outside leaves, different varieties, and then you go out uh, at the time. So it's nice, you go out, you pick your saddle leaves, you go get your eggs from the chicken coop and you go back into the house. And uh, even just sitting at the back, you pick your herbs, but you can just pick the saddle leaf and just crunch it and you're sitting, that's <laughs> tasty salad. And I used to never really eat salads, but now I know why, because they're disgusting. Yeah, but it's, you know, I, I got in the habit of, of just in the summertime, you know, when things are growing, there's just a foot and a half of snow out my window right now. But um, just going out and just harvesting whatever. I'm just training, training myself. Oh, there's plantain, there's dandelion greens, you know, the arugula from the, the garden bed, whatever, and just eating it raw as much as I can. Thinking about bacteria and yeast that I want, which I never thought I'd be. Ten years ago, I never thought I'd be talking about how yummy bacteria and yeast are, but <laughs> we need them for the old microbiome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, salad greens are, that's a great solution. We're hoping to do that this year and just having a tray like you and just mix greens and just picking, picking at them and seeing what rate, you know, how many square feet do we need for our needs on our homestead? My wife and I, it's just us. Um, you know, how many square feet do we need to keep us in salad greens all winter? It's um, not that, I don't think it's that much. I think like 20 square feet should do it. Like, I, but if you're doing it your way as well, just casting them. Uh, just cast yeah, the just, seed. It, you're, you're going to have plenty. You'll miss some. Some might go to seed. You might get seed off it. So, yeah, as well. And you can cast that seed and hopefully it comes up next year. Probably just land race right there in the greenhouse, you know, uh, cast them each year. Um, how deep do you think? Probably good tray of six inches. No, the salad greens don't need that much. Maybe three inches, four inches. How deep the soil for this tray? In my raised bed at the back, I have six inches of soil, maybe. Yeah, okay. And, and that, that was a tight one air. I made a mess oh. of that. This is sort of, I was I was at the early stages of my gardening career, let's say. And, and what I did, I filled it full of rubble and rocks. And it basically drains too quick. I hadn't heard of Google culture at the time. And I was worrying about the beds blowing up. So that the beds are about two foot high. And all the research I've done was like, oh, don't fill that full of soil because it'll explode if it gets wet. Because it'll expand, it'll want to go. But then yeah, it's like what I should have done was just filled it full of trees. I had trees at the time because I cut down trees. Uh, the neighbor's trees, I cut them down. 
So I had the wood, I had everything there, but uh, I just filled it full of rubble. So now I have six inches of soil and uh, on a on a weed weed mat, and then the rest is just rubble. So you can imagine a warm summer's day how how quickly that dries out. Yeah, I was going to say it's like a drainage technique to put gravel underneath something so the water sucks, it gets sucked out of whatever's above it. Yeah, so I'm watering twice a day in the summer just to keep. It's not too bad when I've got plenty of stuff growing and it's covered, but it still dry, dries out very quick. I'm watering every day, which is a, a was a big air, a type one air, but then these things happen. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I've got some type one air. This the funny thing is like a permaculture people when they hear type one air, it's story time. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Here I can I can outdo you. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh well. Uh, my my greenhouse that comes I, I'm in an A frame, and uh, I have a greenhouse that comes off the you know angled off of the A frame, and um, <clears throat> so I put this roof and then I have this angled wall to catch the sun. You know, um, we're at latitude forty five, so that's like twenty two and a half degrees, kind of basically. But I brought this, you know, there's the weight of the roof of the greenhouse, and then it comes down on it came down onto a knee comes down onto a knee wall, two foot knee wall, okay. And the first year after the house was built, um, we were in the house. It's Thanksgiving around that time. Got like three feet of snow, a couple storms in a row. And um, so it was a good three feet of snow and ice on the greenhouse. It's the first year that is it had snow. And we went out for a walk. Just started our walk. And I'm rounding the corner of the greenhouse. And I see that the knee wall has now been pushed about four inches. The weight of the snow on the top was actually, it was the building was slowly collapsing. Oh, um, so I made this design. I designed the house and uh, that was my biggest error. Um, so I, I did it at the last minute. There were some design changes happening. And when, it, you know, and you're, it's Vermont. So you're trying to get this structure built before the winter. And um, so I, I just it was my type one error is is just having all that weight on something that could push a knee wall it was just stupid so the force came and it tied to the top of the knee wall so all the pressure you know if you imagine it coming straight down great but that's not in the reality because i had made these angles it was this angled structure so i had to i had to jump on the roof with a two by four and knock a 50 feet long roof 16 feet deep all that three feet high of snow with the two by four eventually got it all off got it all down came and cut the uh the uh the greenhouse that was on top of the knee wall these triple beamed things and i had to cut the two outer ones and then bring the beams down at this crazy angle tie it into the thing i was up all night going through the structure and the physics of it and all so anyway yeah i almost almost lost the whole house almost that would have damaged the whole side of the house because it's tied into the would have pulled the roof out and that would have been it that that would have been uh, the end. so that was my that. type one error definitely counts <laughs> as a type one error <laughs> oh, yeah. uh your house nearly fell over uh it didn't. In, in the middle of winter in vermont uh, well it's permanently uh, locked in that position too that four inches it's so that knee wall is like angled you see it in the greenhouse some places a little worse than others but um it's it's locked in now it's froze it's baked in but it's a reminder to me to, you know, take that extra step, double check, especially important structural things. <laughs> uh, so I take it that uh, what, what are you doing any growing at the moment? Did you do, do any seed starts yourself or what? Where are you at now? Are you in our few weeks to wait till the snow goes away? Or? We had this discussion earlier uh, last night, actually, and we, um, <laughs> We have an avocado plant we got for Christmas. We're going to nurture that. It's not a seed. Um, we might try to grow tomatoes. Actually, what we're going to do, actually, we had this discussion. We're leaving for California right in the middle of the grow season where we're not, we don't have anybody to farm sit. We're not going to, um, so things would really just die. Most of our starts would die. So we're going to experiment this year with land racing. Whereas we're going to, you know, just kind of care less about the whole thing. And see what grows. See what survive. Whatever survives California is what's going to continue. Um, so we're going to we're going to just sort of take a chance and do some direct seeding, some broadcasting, um, even with the tomatoes. Um, or we're going to maybe start them in. We 
we've got to start the tomatoes indoor, but by the, when we leave for California, we're just going to put them out and hopefully they'll survive. The ones that will are the ones who, you know, are what we want to start our land racing with. Um, but no, it's not a very sexy grow year for us just because the season is, is cut in half. We have a short season to begin with. Um, but it's my goal to get the greenhouse going. And actually I really want to work on the, the, the green. So I might be just from our conversation, I might just be building a box and, uh, put it in my greenhouse and just, you know, temporarily and fill it with some soil and just broadcast, um, lettuce greens. <laughs> uh, I've seen so, too, as, as well, um, basically you have a greenhouse. I've seen people put cold frames inside their greenhouse. So you, he says you got his own eight. You could possibly get his own nine with an extra layer, and then absolutely, and then put another layer of PVC on if it's really cold, and then you get, uh, and then what? What this, I seen them do? They have like a hinge box, so they just open up the box. Then so it's like they allow the airflow. So if it's the middle of the day, lifting the box up. I've seen that. Um, that's sort of what I do. But I think that the, I suppose the important part for beginner gardeners there, as you mentioned, is. Do what you can where you are, because a lot of videos you watch is, look at all this food, isn't this fantastic? And then it's very overwhelming. And I, I've done it myself, or just try to, you know, a thousand seed starts, just going mad. And then I never got to get the seeds in the ground, and then you feel bad, and you feel and you lose heart. So just the advice to begin again is just take it slow, and just do what you can. And like like I, I mean, one year went on holidays, and um. Just as my strawberries ripened, so when I came back, all the strawberries, the, the, then the place was covered in wasps because the the uh, effect of the strawberries were rotten on the vine or on the on the plant. So then the wasps were in, and once the wasps came, the strawberries nobody was getting the strawberries. So it's just don't put too much pressure on yourself. That you just basically grow what you can, and if you can do a greens bed, that's great. It's a great start. And it's not that much maintenance. And if you go away for two weeks, well, you come back and you just wrap it up and plant more if you can't eat them. And in a month, you'll have another greens bed. Yeah, greens are pretty forgiving. I mean, if you are if you haven't done anything else, just start with some greens. They, they grow fast. They're forgiving. Um, they, they handle pretty good temperature. You know, they, they handle some cold. Um, yeah, adding layers like um, Elliot Coleman, remember, sort of a horticulturalist from Maine He's written some books. He's really, he has a four, he does a four season harvest in Maine. Um, and he does just what, what Cormac said. He does layers. He, he got a greenhouse or, or whatever. And then he's got another hoop around it as a second layer, like a double paned window works. It's the same sort of concept. You really get a, you get a really good boost, maybe even a third layer. You know, if you had a, like a little plastic bin finally underneath there, um, but, uh, yeah, don't, I mean, some plants aren't going to grow in some, so you definitely plants aren't going to grow everywhere. So you could make mistakes, but you can't, unless you're buying fruit trees, you really just can't make mistakes. Um, you know, uh, because a lot of this is inexpensive, especially if you're, you're collecting seeds and you have a lot of seeds, then, um, you know, you got 500 seeds here, throw a couple over there. It's, it's not going to matter. It's the biggest bang for your buck to see, you know, what you actually get out of that yield for what you put into it is, uh, yeah, it's really, that's profitable, you know. Yeah, and do, do you collect seeds? I, I have only really collected, uh, I've collected nasturtium seeds. I haven't really collected green green seeds. Uh, herb seeds, I've collected them. Um, I have a nice flowering plant, Sweet William, you ever heard of that No. It's like really nice white flowers. So they, they, they give off thousands of seed. They basically self seed every year. They just fall on the ground and they grow. Um, so I've never been a big seed saver as such. Do you, do you save uh, some flower seeds to save? So maybe, maybe that's, we maybe that's just two. Just <laughs> we, before last year, this, um, these California trips, um, are completely last year. This is the last time she's moving back to the east coast our daughter so this will be the last year for that um yeah we've we have maybe 
we have seeds from our old garden. We were gardening in Pennsylvania. So we've been doing this for about our whole marriage, about 15 years. We had a garden in Pennsylvania. We weren't doing permaculture. We were doing more standard American gardening, but learning all the time. And that's, you know, talk about land racing and seeds and how seeds are actually smart, you know, but they need generations to to lock that intelligence in. Um, like, uh, I'm not really answering your question directly, Cormac. I think I'm going <laughs> a tangent here, but uh, like, uh, you know, they say that growing food is, uh, it's not really about, or farming or, or homesteading or, or whatever you're doing. It, it's not a, it's not so much about growing the food, but really growing, you're growing the farmer, growing your knowledge each year. And the, the more you time, more time that you spend to like smell the roses, pun intended, um, you know, the, the quicker you will grow in your satisfaction with doing this for whatever reason, you're doing it for health or you're doing it for survival or doing it for just because you enjoy plants. Um, but yeah, there's, you're never going to learn everything about all the plants. It's an extremely complicated subject, but you can definitely learn enough to make it a sustainable, enjoyable, uh, yield producing uh, practice each year, whether you're saving seeds or cloning or, or whatever. Um, the one thing I would avoid, and you know, I don't try not to tell people what to do, but I would definitely agree with Cormac to just avoid genetically modified seeds. That's just the most obvious, like if you had a selection of beverages from like, you know, water, um, tea, orange juice, and gasoline, <laughs> don't pick the gasoline. <laughs> don't yeah. pick the gasoline. Definitely not. And uh, I like your point is really about growing the farmer. So it's this is something I always tell people and and uh, when I'm doing designs for them, that is, do the type grow the type of food that suits yourself and suits your personality. So, I am not a very active gardener. Like I, I could never run a market garden. It's just too intense. Me neither. <laughs> so that's that's in the extremes. Uh, I like lazy gardening. I like throwing potatoes in the ground. And coming back a few months later, and I get more spuds. It's a wee bit of work either side, but in between, very little, maybe a bit of mulching or adding, adding some compost or adding some feed, adding some compost tea, but there's not a lot of work. I don't like growing tomatoes because you have to go out every day and you have to check them, you have to water them, you have to nurture them, you have to make sure they're fed. So it's like at growing the farmer is a bit like growing the seed, just develop the strengths that suit your personality. So that you can actually grow in a way that makes you happy. So if you're energetic, go for it. Knock yourself out. Get the rose. Get the high production. Get it in there. Get it out. Get it harvested. Get it cleaned. Yeah. All the stuff that comes with growing a lot of annuals. Or if you're a bit lazier, more relaxed about things, you want to be out in the garden and enjoying it more. Go towards more perennials. And just grow the annuals that you enjoy. If it's flowers, get perennial flowers. Just to, they come back every year. It's easy. You have a bit of pruning. So it's that to me, that's, that's very similar to the seed growing. As you develop, you develop your strengths and your strengths for where you are and where you're at. Yeah, and it's while you're talking, I'm realizing like you're land raising yourself. Yeah, you know, each year, um, you know, your knowledge in, in a way. You're um, yeah, I've had this discussion about a week ago um and yeah exactly like you know we moved we changed climate we're a species homo sapiens right ginkgo biloba and there's homo sapiens just two different species so and it, it's you know as a human it's easy as a fabulous human you know in modern times the world that we live in it's easy to forget that we're really just an animal honestly we're really just a plant but that's another discussion. Um, <laughs> so like having changed, <laughs> having changed from uh, zone seven, seven B, which uh, is, you know, hot summers is Pennsylvania to zone three B technically, I consider it four though. Um, and, you know, we, we got, it took us a few winters to get used to the cold. Now I can just walk out in the cold and, you know, like cold is like below zero Fahrenheit. Now, anything above that is I can just go out. I don't need a coat, you know, not for too long, but so and but but back in my Pennsylvania days when I was had all the NPK I needed, you know, everything was kind of supplied for me that wise. Yeah, you, know, you tend to stay in the house, you don't you go out. So if it gets a little cold back then, I'd get chilly and have to get a sweater, you know. But now I don't, you know. So that I consider that a little bit of land racing, 
just because I'm I'm adjusting to a different a different climate. Um, you know, so it's interesting. Yeah, extremely complicated. It is. So, uh, aye. So, any last bit of advice for 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 our beginner gardeners? Uh, on seed starting and starting seedlings or any nuggets of wisdom my advice is you know as far as the method of seed we talk about different methods of, of seed planting my favorite is the blocks because yeah it's a, it's a machine it's made out of metal it's going to last except for the the little nipple things are made out of plastic and they're going to probably going to lose them but uh that that's the nicest just because you, you're there's no extra material involved it's just the soil but it's a little harder because you have to get the consistency of the the soil down each time or it'll fall apart um if you're if you're really good at with saving things and egg cartons and toilet paper rolls and and even just newspaper you could fold newspaper into a um you know a little cup honestly and just put some soil into it if you're if you're good at that kind of thing. Yeah, I seen that. I seen um, that. I, I suppose we should have really included that. I seen that. That's really good. Yeah, I mean anything like that. You get you don't want color. You got to watch about think about what chemicals might be in that paper or whatever. And based on your standards of that, because you know there's molecules everywhere. Um, but so yeah, uh, come up with a method that you that you like the best. Some methods are le less high maintenance than others. Nothing wrong with buying a good old fashioned plastic seed tray with a whole bunch of things, you know, maybe 50 in a, in a tray. And again, if you put this, the, the topsoil in there, the roots, once the seedling in, in a month or three weeks or whatever is two months, it's ready to go out. Those roots have really made that soil block pretty firm so that you could kind of pull it out. And um, so yeah, but I, my advice I, is, is, is really just to, you know, Pick pick that the method out of those that you want. Avoid putting toxins in there, um, and just make sure that your seeds are not genetically modified. And um, you know, I, I really believe that um, um, this word just hates me. Heirloom, heirloom, <laughs> heirloom seeds are the best. That's all I have. Uh, to say. So it's air, I, I would say heirloom seeds or organic soil, uh, worm. Worm castings, if you get it, really makes a big difference. Vermicompost, we'll chat about that some other weekend that's coming up soon. And basically, I like the soil blocks because there's no waste. Um, the cheap plastic trays, like they break in a couple of years, but I think there is a lot of developments. I know Charles Dowdy now in the UK has, say, he has a Charles new Dowdy. he has a new uh seed tray that's out. I think it's more rubbery, I don't know, never. It seems stronger than the. It's just, it's not as wasteful, but again, it's like you don't need these. You can use newspaper. You can use toilet roll. You can use these things. You don't have to invest in it. But to me, the ultimate is the soil block. And there's something. Uh, to me, there's something nice about getting that mix. Now, I I used a mix off the internet. It was a very basic mix. It was three three parts, multi purpose. One part perlite, which is like a wee white, like a volcanic rock. It it, it allows for the air, uh, sort of like the... Aeration. Aeration. Uh, and then one part, uh, like my own homemade compost, which is full of worm castings. You can see it, it's black. It's it's lovely stuff. It's been lying there, must be two years. It's chock full of worms and just really, really good stuff. And, and I, uh, that's what I made that mix out of and it seemed to work it's holding up I got big blocks and I'll have to refine it for the small blocks but it's great because you can just line out the blocks and you just pick them up and block them on the ground and that's you <laughs> and it's really you don't have to wedge them out and then you push you know, and you push them trays out and the trays start breaking and it breaks up but if there's not enough root everything falls apart and then you're to me, it's just a it's a very elegant uh, method. That's probably the word, and I don't mind the the finding the mix and adding the water till you get the right mix. I don't mind that, but and it's yeah. to me, it's very fast because all these other methods take to me a bit longer, especially the ziplock bag. 
the tub methods. But I just like if I had enough room, that's what I'd be doing. Um, so I can't wait to get a greenhouse. But <laughs> <laughs> right, my my my, my gardening <laughs> this year has been sort of messed up because we're we're moving house, so I I don't want to invest too much time in the ceilings. Think about like a hoop house. No, I have no hoop house at all. I had a greenhouse, but I had the cheap ones. And like an English style greenhouse with glass or like no, a nothing was a it was a plastic um piece of junk that <laughs> that rusted. Like imagine a greenhouse pipes rusting. So it's it's like it's like a chocolate teapot. <laughs> it's like it's not much good if it rusts after two or three years. <laughs> and uh I could blew over, I got damaged. It was just a wee cheap thing, but then I discovered I don't really need one. Um, because I'm not that intense. I'm not sitting in January going, I need to get I, I wanna I'm not trying to optimize the year as in right. you no, know, I have to get this on by a certain date. I don't stress myself out about these things. If I go, don't get it in, I don't get it in. If, if life is busy that year, well, I haven't done much gardening this year, but at least I've some wee bit done. Um, which is which is the luxury we have in modern society. Our ancestors didn't have a choice. They no. had to get a crop in or they go into debt or they die, you know. So it's it it is nice in modern times to uh, you know, I kind of have that choice of but, uh production but, or not. I but you mentioned seed scattering, it's not not more they did years ago was like say if they found a seed they would just scatter the seeds and see what grew anyway if they were walking I don't know I think there's some evidence that the Amazon was a actually a food forest that when they yeah the uh, charcoal uh, the um yeah the, all the charcoal they discovered um all right, so I can't the name of it so they actually so say they I don't know they got uh say they, there was a banana pup they would they would break the pup away and they'd walk half a mile and plunk plunk it in the ground Along the uh-huh. walking routes, so it's actually. I think there was some theory that that's all Amazon just wasn't this wild thing that popped up. That was actually a big food forest, and it was organized, and they were doing stuff like that. That they were propagating trees along the along the walking paths, so they were actually building foraging routes rather than traditional agricultural gardens. And that's community level too. That's not like my trees. That's uh, our trees. You know. This, this is where everyone walk. That's that's some. I mean, this is a podcast about seeds, and we kind of <laughs> tangent it on just whatever we wanted to. But um, uh, you know, um, but that is just that is that's super fascinating to me. In fact, right out my window here, there's, and this isn't the Amazon level. Well, it is. It's about the same time scale actually. But there's a tree. There's a Native American thing where they would they would take a tree and they would bend a young tree and bend bend the branch so that it would stick out and have this elbow effect. And so it would come out and then go up and it points in a direction so that when people were walking through the woods, it would direct them. And I, I swear to gosh, I think there's, cause there's a really old maple here. This is Abenaki territory. This is where maple syrup where it was, you know, maple sap, boiling maple sap was discovered by the Abenaki. But, um, that's fascinating because that's it's the same kind of thing where you're just it's a community thing where you know th- there's these things for common good um that you can just set up in the thing whether you're planting trees for future foragers or you know so yeah it's this community thing where you you're ba- you're basically paying it forward it's not this sort of transactional thing going on where I got this and you got that which there's nothing wrong with that but there's something even more beautiful about that community level and that um you know thinking of the land as ours as opposed to mine you know yeah and it, even even though like where, where i am there's loads of green space like there's no reason why it shouldn't be lined with food <laughs> should be should be fruit trees here no and it's like they they build these dual carriageways big motorways and they just they, they put these trees on it that they just put they, they're like miles and miles of waterway you get miles and miles of fruit trees you get miles uh, although I don't know about the toxins on the fruit trees with all the cars, but when they do when they do yeah. these things, to me, I keep looking now and think, well, how much food could you get out of that wee space? And like, there's people starving. There's poverty here, and poverty's not far away. And um, the these solutions are there, and it's just like, well, maybe we should just be 
planting trees yourself it's like a what do they call it gorilla gardening just <laughs> gorilla garden yeah right yeah uh, just start planting trees and see see if the see if the council take them away or not yeah that's another it's another form uh, of land raising it's, it's not the, uh, the chilly winter that kills your trees it's the uh you know functionary from the government or whatever but still like um yeah, that's that's interesting. But back to your point about the food, that's amazing. Like the that the Amazon may actually be a designed food forest just long before we thought we invented permaculture, you know. Um, and even even in in North America, I think there's a lot of like major trees and major things that were planted by the Native Americans, and then there's whole regions that you just don't know what the history was because it might have just been a small plot, and then that took off because somebody planted it they bothered to plant it and where they had cultivated areas and so we just don't even know it's just like yeah it's easy to just think oh the trees were just here and people walk through the trees and that's it but no i mean humanity for sure like you've mentioned in ireland you cut down all the trees that happened a lot of places around the world easter island and you know so there's dramatic so you know instead of cutting down trees you have the other end of planting trees and having this positive legacy that got away from you because you died a hundred years ago or 300 years ago or a thousand years ago. But what you planted your garden may still be self-seeding and reproducing and, you know, thriving. This is so interesting. It's interesting because it, it adds yet another layer of complexity to plants, which is this like kind of human history weaved in this history of plants. So. I think we should leave it there on that. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so, okay. yeah. Uh, on that climax, uh, Mike, thanks very much for joining us tonight. Uh, yep. Hopefully, we get these out more regular now. Uh, and uh, uh, it's been great, great having a chat with you. And uh, okay. thanks, thanks to everybody who joined us. If you reached this far, well done. <laughs> yeah, God bless you. If you're still here. <laughs> uh, so thanks very much. We'll see you all next week. Cheers. Okay. See you. By myself, only me No one can guess what I came there to see There's a sun in the sky There's a cloud